Welcome back to Goldmark TV once more. We've got a, a really exciting, colourful show for you today because we're going to be looking at some of my favourite things, posters. We're going to be delving not just into artist posters, which we've been talking about a lot at, at the Goldmark Gallery, but right into the history of the poster from the Maitre de la Fiche and uh, Paris, Belle Epoque Paris, uh, the fin de siècle, uh, right the way through the First World War and to artist posters of the 20th century. Then my colleague Kate is going to be talking to you about Patrick Caulfield, an artist who began as a, a, a poster maker, as a, a working in advertising. She's going to be looking at his fantastic La Forgue screen prints. And then to round off today's day of, of vibrant colour, we'll be looking at the, the wonderful vases of Jean-Nicolas Gérard uh, and seeing how he, he gets his fantastic slip surfaces. I hope you really enjoy today. First up today, we're going to be taking a look at the history of the poster. Now, we tend to harp on about artist posters here at the gallery. Uh, they're one of our, our favourite things to introduce people to. There's something about that mixture of, of uh, images of the, the great artists of the 20th century uh, and the text below, this wonderful combination of art and design that makes them a really interesting and, for the most part, affordable introduction to, to art. Uh, and they seem to sit well in people's homes wherever. To stop you, boring you with that story yet again, uh, we're going to delve right into the history of the poster. Posters really begin with uh, the Maître de la Fiche, uh, the masters of the poster in Belle Epoque, Paris, at the end of the 19th century. And those posters, the Maître de la Fiche, begin with a man called Jules Cherry. Jules Cherry was not the inventor of lithography, the print process which made posters a viable medium for people to, to use as advertising. But he was one of the people who um, made a huge technological advance in the process. He'd been trained as a lithographer in Britain, and then he came back to Paris to start up his own enterprise. What Cherry managed to do was invent a new form of chromolithography, colour lithography, a three-colour process in particular, which flooded the world of advertising, which was uh, until then largely black and white text, with a riot of colour. Sherry's uh, uh, advances in, in lithography uh, led to a, a huge boom in poster art, and he was responsible not just as a, as a printmaker, but also as a publisher, an artist himself, and a promoter of the artists who worked within this tradition. At first, these were designed huge in its scale, and all of a sudden, landlords, uh, local management, public and private spaces suddenly realised the value of their real estate, of vertical space. Virtually every street, public and private, scaffolding, even monuments, and the fantastic circular Colonne Maurice, those advertising rotundas, so typical of Paris, were plastered with works just like these. Cherie's role as a, as a publicist, as a promoter of poster art, not just a maker of it, really came to a fore with the Maître de la Fiche. At the time, uh, bill stickers were, were scuffling over disputes, over uh, disputed territories to get their posters up. And once they pasted them up, uh, within a few minutes, collectors were coming and trying to peel them down from the walls. They were incredibly um, popular and, and thought uh, to be valuable uh, by, by those who, uh, who loved this new wave of, 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 uh, of Art Nouveau poster design. So Sherry came up with a new idea, the Metro de la Fiche. This was a, a, almost a subscription model uh, where collectors, instead of having to go out and actually try and peel down these, these huge posters from the walls after they'd been stuck, they could uh, pay a monthly fee and they'd be sent a number of, of uh, posters at reduced size, these small versions that we see here. This gave Sherry a couple of opportunities. Not only uh, were people able to get their, their hands on a, a much wider, wider variety of, of poster images, but also because the plates were much smaller, the prints could be produced much more uh, professionally, colours would be much more true, the textures. Not having to work at these big industrial scales, Sherry could really get some of the, the luxury uh, of poster making into the, into the, the printing process. Uh, a luxury that matched the products and the world that was being advertised in them. 
I've got here uh, one of the most famous posters from this time, from the Metro de la Fiche series, by Mucha. And you can see immediately uh, that that sense of luxury, that sense of, uh, of, uh, of um, sort of wanton abandon, uh, of, of, of partying and reveling. But you can also see it reflected in the print process. If I tilt this down slightly, you might be able to make out that this fantastic golden hair on this muse here is actually reflective. It's got a sort of a gold reflection to the ink. Reduced at these sizes and, and produced in, in little portfolios, these could be sent to collectors where they could store them uh, properly, have them in, in beautiful mint condition and get out and, and, uh, and show to their friends in storage cases not unlike this. So the Metro de la Fiche posters were being produced uh, in Belle Epoque, Paris, fin de siècle, the end of the end of the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century, a time of uh, extraordinary uh, luxuriance and elegance uh, and the rise of Art Nouveau, uh, an artist style that sort of drew on a number of different influences, particularly things like Japanese art uh, and the worlds of design and, and textiles. Uh, and lent images a, a wonderful lyrical kind of movement across the image, which lent itself perfectly to the world of advertising. This was the Paris of Toulouse-Lautrec's Moulin Rouge of Le Chat Noir, a world of, of cafes and underground, a world of dancing and drinking, of concert halls and cabaret, of theatre, uh, of wine, tobacco, chocolate, uh, soaps and perfumes. All of that world was reflected in the posters that were made. In particular, the influence of the Orient, of the East, of, of uh, travels to, to China and Japan, and the art that was being brought back at the time uh, had a huge influence on poster art. In particular, the woodblocks of Japan, the woodcuts uh, by um, famous Japanese artists like Hokusai. So in fact, if you look in this wonderful poster here, advertising a a lamp up here, the shape of this light coming out here, there's a wonderful red and green background here, and these beautiful block colours, it's actually very similar to a wood block print of Mount Fuji that you'll find by Hokusai. A number of things were, were popularly advertised, uh, booze is one in, in particular, champagne, cigarettes and tobacco, uh, cigars, uh, articles of, of, of luxury, but also um, common everyday uh, materials, things like soaps and cloths, boots, clothes. It was really a, a world of, of extraordinary uh, consumerism. We've actually got a, an advert for the sun here. In fact, I've got another one down here I can pull up. For those of you who don't live in the UK, uh, the sun is a, a tabloid, a, a sort of magazine come newspaper. Of, um, of particular ethical standards or non-standards. It's interesting to compare these two adverts to the, the modern day sun. I imagine these women on these covers would have a, a lot fewer clothes on in, in today's, uh, today's uh, versions. One of the things that, that typifies these Metro de la Fiche uh, uh, reduction posters is that they've got a, a fantastic stamp that was uh, designed by, by Charest that you'll find here in these, in these lower right-hand corners. This world of, of lavish indulgence that was popularised in the posters of Metro de la Fiche really continued right into the 1900s. But as we approached uh, sort of uh, the 1910s, the poster was sort of met with its first decline, really, its first decline in popularity. Suddenly, it was in a, at a time when it was having to compete for, for interest. The likes of radio, of uh, newspapers and fashion magazines, brochures, uh, even uh, the cinema and the camera, which were sort of uh, emerging technologies. Suddenly, the poster found that it really had to, to fight for people's attention. And then, in 1914, the world of the poster, the role of the poster, was turned upside down as Europe was plunged into war.
So we're now in our exhibition space upstairs in the gallery uh, with these extraordinary French World War I posters. Now the poster of the Metro de la Fiche generation had been created for and driven by a, a world of frenzied consumption and, and manufacturing, uh, by that world of, of, of lavishness and, and, and luxury. Suddenly, the First World War plunged the poster into this very strange, this, this bizarre, ironic turn of events where this tool for, for trying to get people to buy was now suddenly trying to uh, suppress those urges in its, in its people, uh, to try and get them to scrimp and to save or to hand over their purchasing power to the state by buying war bonds. These posters are, are uh, French, so the, we'll see certain sort of recurring images in them. In particular, in these three, you've got Marianne. She's the, the sort of the, the French Britannia. Uh, she became a, a recurring motif in these figures of sort of of whipping up national sense of identity, of trying to get people to pull behind and help the country get through this very difficult period. The war poster was now forced to suppress the very world of, of urges and consumerism at which it had fed and on which it had thrived. Suddenly, governments crippled by, by national debts, by rising costs of, of uh, sustaining the war, looked to prey on very different kind of emotional strains from the, the, the posters of, of old. Guilt and fear, uh, and, and trying to get a sense of, 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 um, of, uh, of national uh, collectiveness, of unity uh, in their posters. Previously, with the Metro de la Fiche, the posters that had done best had been those that had been stuck up around uh, often uh, working class areas of the city, places where uh, the, the threat of being overshadowed by the wireless, uh, by, uh, by cinemas and the theatre was, was less obvious. Those posters had also uh, played to, uh, to working class aspirations. They'd presented often very mundane products, um, soaps and bleaches, with this kind of whiff of, of middle class luxury. All of a sudden, it was working class people that they were appealing to, again, this time the government, and it was for a, a very different reason, for a very different kind of uh, uh, propagandising. You'll see in these three posters, trying to get people to sign up to, to support the, uh, the, uh, the, the government uh, and the army, they were now drawing on a very different kind of sentiment, a very different kind of appeal. These images of, of sort of uh, square-jawed, freshly-faced, everyday characters, soldiers that could be uh, sons, husbands, fathers, in an attempt to, to, to sort of galvanise uh, interest and, and support for the government. There's a particular fact about this poster that you won't find in any history book. In fact, on the, the third Pink Panther film, the production team uh, setting up the apartment for, for Clouseau, uh, played by Peter Sellers, they sourced one of these posters for that apartment. Now, you won't get that in a history book. Now, as different countries, different governments were faced with very different problems during the First World War, um, the messages used in the posters would vary from, from country to country and from area to area. So, for example, a lot of relief funds were, were, were popularised. Uh, here we've got one for soldiers suffering from tuberculosis. But in France, in particular, the message was almost completely unified, as you'll see in these two posters here. And that message was suscrive, suscrive, suscrive. What it meant was subscribing, signing up to payments of, of, of sort of liberty loans, of paying off the, uh, the war debt, uh, which was issued in a number of bonds across the war. But it had a sort of a secondary meaning, a second kind of suggestion to it of signing up, of people gathering uh, uh, for, to go to the front. And it saw uh, a huge influx of new recruits across a number of years. Now, obviously during the First World War, at a, at a time of, of great rationing, uh, producing big, colourful posters like this was uh, an expenditure. They cost money to produce, they were expensive. So they had to make sure that these posters were going to be effective and that the, the most emotive, the most patriotic, those that had the, the best uh, success rate were going to be produced. You'll find that often the, the artists that were commissioned for these posters were actually the same artists who uh, had popularised their work, had, had um, uh, sort of promoted their, their CV as uh, contributors to things like the Metro de la Fiche. So what we have here are, are two posters. There's one here by Theophile Steinlin, 
who was a very famous uh, poster artist, uh, artist of the Belle Epoque, who's lent his hand to this, this poster. This is for the Serbian Relief Fund. And then across here, a piece by Sem. Sem was the, the pseudonym of Georges Gorsau. He was a, a caricaturist who again had sort of risen to popularity in the, the end of the, the 19th century and then turned his abilities with the pen, his draftsmanship, during the First World War to producing fantastic posters like this one. Both the Metro de la Fiche and these propaganda posters demonstrate how the poster was a, a hugely versatile medium. It was a, a tool, really, for whoever, whoever was using it for engaging with and, and prompting an emotional response of, of many different kinds. It's interesting to, to think, though, actually, looking at the, the artists who, who uh, made their careers uh, in the Metro de la Fiche and who then uh, contributed to war posters like these, it was actually rather a long time before artists were sort of uh, routinely using posters to exhibit and promote their own work. There were certain artists, Bonnard uh, is one in particular, who, who came out of a, a, an early career as a poster artist. Toulouse-Lautrec, people like Steinlein, uh, who popularised uh, poster art as, a, as, a, as a, a, a medium in its own right. But it'd be some time before artists really took to promoting their own work, as we're going to see in a minute. So you're now rejoining us uh, in part of our, our large stock section upstairs uh, in the gallery. Um, I'm next to the posters rack. This is where we keep all of our artist posters. Now, our collection of artist posters, 20th century uh, posters, uh, probably runs to more than 100 pieces. So uh, today I'm just going to be showing you a couple of my favourites and a couple of those that really illustrate how different artists have taken to, to this, this method of, of uh, promoting exhibitions and work. Really, the rise of the artist poster, of, of artists producing posters specifically to promote their work, to promote exhibitions and, and, uh, and touring shows, really starts in the sort of the first half of the, the 20th century. It took a long time for artists to, to accept the poster, not just as a, a medium in its own right, but a, a medium which they wanted to, to use as a, uh, in this way. And it particularly came about with large public exhibitions uh, from public galleries in, in, in Paris, London, uh, New York and, and, and Tokyo. This first one I'd like to show you, this is by Raoul Dufy. And it gives an idea for what a poster can really offer, not just the artist, but also um, the collector. Really, there are three types of posters. There's the original artist poster. That's a poster that the artist has designed completely from scratch in order to promote an exhibition. And then there are those that are made by printmakers, um, sometimes after artist paintings or, or, or drawings, uh, with the artist's uh, um, uh, acceptance, with their approval, but also with their supervision. And then the third type are those reproductions of, of artists' work uh, for, for posters, which have nothing to do with the artists whatsoever and are often promoted as if they were real, uh, real pieces. Often these are sort of um, digitally produced and they're, they're fairly crappy in, in quality. Those I'm showing you today are, are, are mostly original artist posters and certainly not uh, the last kind. So this is after a, a Dufy uh, painting. Now Dufy was a printmaker, but um, you'll not find any uh, Dufy prints this size. And to buy a painting by Dufy uh, of this size would cost you an awful lot of money. So Dufy is a fantastic example of how artist posters give us a, 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 a wonderful opportunity to see Dufy in all his rich colour, his vibrancy, the things that make Dufy's work so engaging and so popular at, at this sort of wonderful scale. This was produced for, a, for a, an exhibition um, in Paris, as you can see up here in the, uh, the top left, uh, right hand corner. And it shows off Dufy's uh, fantastic use of colour. He was a, an artist who sort of grew up on the, on the, on the Riviera, who saw the sort of the wonderful luxury yachts, the racing, uh, as a, um, a sort of a middle-class family upbringing. He had to work quite early as a, as a child to support the family. As a, as a textiles maker and also as, a, as an artist, they were the, the sort of scenes, the sights, the colours that really engaged him uh, as an artist in, in later life, and which remained his sort of um, uh, his, his subject through his paintings. I pulled this out because this is one of my favourite posters.
There are a number of artists who, who really took to poster design as a, a way of uh, disseminating their, their work more, more freely, more, more broadly, uh, and, and who enjoyed the, the technical process of, of designing from scratch. You think of artists in particular, uh, Miro, Chagall, uh, Leger, Matisse, but probably most importantly, Picasso. I've got a couple of posters from Picasso here to show you. Now these have been produced in, in liner cut. In the sort of um, the early 1950s to the to the to the early 1960s, Picasso has spent an awful lot of time making making liner cuts, and he was introduced to the medium by uh, a printmaker called Arnera. And in these sort of um, these periods where Picasso would spend his time in, in places like Valery or, or Mougin, uh, where he sort of went to go and make pottery, Arnera introduced him to liner cut uh, printing and suggested it would be a fantastic way of making, making posters with ease. Cutting these very large blocks would be, would be uh, fairly easy because lino is such a, uh, a malleable material. But it gives these lino cut posters a really kind of wonderful feel that's, that's very different from those, those sort of very slick colours in the, in the lithographic posters we saw earlier. This is, this is a nice example, I think, advertising a, an exhibition of his, of his pottery in Valerie. You can see the outline of this sort of this fantastic, almost sort of ancient Greek style pot here. And then in this next poster, again, that fantastic medium of liner cut. There's something about the wonderful jagged edges, the sort of the, the bright uh, sort of uh, boldness of liner cut that meant that actually Picasso didn't have to, to, to fiddle too much with his colours, didn't have to sort of uh, try and uh, wow and, and, and dazzle with, a, with his palette. It was really just the, the vigour of the, the line of cutting into these big blocks. The other fantastic thing about posters, of course, is that they were designed to be enjoyed. They were designed to capture attention. That was their purpose. It, their purpose was to, to advertise shows, to, to get people in through the doors. And so when you're buying a poster, you're not just buying uh, an, artist, uh, an artist's work, an artist uh, sort of enjoying the the, the, the new challenges of design, you're buying a piece that was deliberately intended to be really good. There's one artist in particular that I'd like to highlight for their, uh, their approach to poster uh, production, and that's Chagall. Chagall was known for being a, an exceptionally generous artist. He took on public commissions uh, all the time, and he's one of the few artists who uh, were major artists who were approached to, to make posters uh, for, for products, for other institutions not just advertising his own work. Often those fell through because of the interrelating interests of the various parties involved, but in particular in his, in his exhibition posters, Chagall was fantastically generous. But in, in a number of Chagall's uh, uh, exhibition posters, he designed them himself from scratch uh, as, as sort of brand new lithographs rather than reproducing existing works. This is one of my absolute favourites. Look at the fantastic colour the vibrancy, this is Chagall his sort of lyrical romantic best. And he took the time for this particular exhibition to, to produce this lithograph from scratch. This is, a, this is an original, uh, original poster, original print. Produced as art pieces, these were produced as, as tools for, for advertising. They were used as, as the marketing campaign for exhibitions and they were put up. Some were framed but a lot were, were posted and pinned to walls put up in, in towns and in the, in the institutions that were holding the exhibitions. So the number of these that are in, sort of fan, in fantastic condition are, are fewer and fewer, they're becoming more and more scarce. This I thought was a really lovely one to show you. There's another Chagall poster that I'd like you to see here that I think is really interesting. Now as I said, Chagall was a, a, a generous artist and he particularly insisted uh, when he was making posters, uh, in particular with the Moulot Frere, who were really the preeminent lithography uh, atelier uh, in, in the world uh, in the sort of 20th century in Paris. He insisted that when he was producing a, a poster, if it was not uh, an original print, if it was not an original poster, if it was a, a reproduction of a, a painting or a gouache design that he'd made for that, for that poster, and it wasn't him that had actually drawn the lithographic plate, he insisted that there would be a note on the print that said who'd engraved it, and often that would be Charles Saulier, who was the, um, the sort of the prominent uh, lithographer at, at Moulot at the time. This is another original lithograph. This is one that Chagall printed himself. But the interesting thing about this, 
you've got the, the typical imagery that, that Shigal liked to employ of, of the Bible here. This is God handing down the, the tablets of law to Moses. You can see Moses down here with this fantastic sort of rays of light that come out of his head in Shigal's work. But what's interesting about this poster is Shigal was so pleased with it, he so enjoyed the image and, and making the image, that he asked if he could take away the black plate. That's the plate that gives you this black line. There have been separate plates of the different colours. He asked if he could take away the black plate and, and, and redraw it and, and work it up into a completely different print. That's something very rare, something that you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, expect from an artist, particularly when they're making a, an edition of, of a large number of, of, of prints like these posters. Just a, a, another uh, example of how Chagall was a, a fairly generous artist. We've seen right from the beginning with the Maitre de la Fiche that the poster is not just an art form, but it's also been used as a, as a, a wonderful medium, a way of uh, getting messages across, of, of trying to convince people of things, of trying to convey different messages, of, um, of sort of combining different emotional tugs and strains on, on people uh, in the same way that, that, that ordinary art can do. One of the, the great disappointments in poster art, though, is that um, unlike those artists uh, in the Maitre de la Fiche, those who lent their talents to, to commercial projects, who got their art out in what was then called the, the People's Gallery, the posters along the streets, in the boulevards, they were known as the, the frescoes of the people, uh, the, the poor man's uh, museum. Unlike those artists, uh, many of the artists of the 20th century weren't able to, to engage themselves in similar projects. And so there are some artists for whom we have artist posters, and we get a real sense of the, the, the fantastic uh, sort of verve that they might have been able to bring to this medium. And one of those is Leger, whose work is sort of in its boldness, in its brightness, its, its sort of primary colour, it lends itself so well to poster making that it's a real shame that we haven't got sort of early posters from, from Leger's early career when he was maybe, uh, could have undertaken projects much like those under the, the Metro de la Fiche of advertising for, for different companies. Instead, we have these fantastic exhibition posters that he produced. And I love in, in posters this, this combination of, of image and text, of, of the aspects of design that impinge on the image making. This wonderful sort of clean, grotesque script that's at the, at the bottom of this, this poster. It's a wonderful foil to the, to the bold black line and the colour in this particular image. And somehow that interrelation of design, of art, these different sort of threads that are, are, are there in, in, in poster making, it means that the images can sort of inhabit any space. They, they sit well alongside other fine art prints in, in the home, but they also sort of lend themselves to offices, to, to um, collections of, of different kinds. There's something about that combination of art and design that makes them so flexible. Here's a lovely final Leger image to finish on here with the red, white and blue of France. The same country where back with the, the Metro de la Fiche, the poster first began. So what then of the poster in the rest of the 20th century, in the last 60, 70 years? Well, artists seeing the successes of people like Matisse and Picasso, Chagall in their, in their posters, um, it's become a, a, a sort of fairly regular recurrent thing for, for people to advertise their exhibitions. But really the, the life of the poster lives far beyond uh, those worlds of, of, of establishment and, and institutional art. We saw in 1960s uh, how the student revolutions in Paris embraced the poster as a, as a quick means of, of getting their message across, of, of sort of emblazoning uh, th their fury on, on the page and, uh, and sort of uh, whipping up uh, a, a sort of um, agreement for their, for their cause. And the poster has been used in that kind of political way uh, for a number of uh, years in, in many different places. If you think about people like the urban artists today, really uh, an awful lot of their, their graffiti art has its, its roots in, in, in poster making. The poster's never really been able to escape that, that political nature that we saw in those World War I posters. And in fact, that you can feel in some of those Metro de la Fiche posters too. Really, it remains a, a hugely versatile medium. There's something that can be approached by fine artists, by designers, by graphic designers and typographers. Something about that combination of different schools of thought make it such a fertile ground for artists. So we can expect to see the poster continue to be 
a, a vital part of our, our visual world and one that I hope you've enjoyed exploring with me today. Today we're going to have a look at the set of 22 screen prints. Patrick Caulfield made them to illustrate 12 of the poems by the French poet Jules Laforgue. And they were put together as a, as a collection, um, as a book, and it was the only artist book that Patrick Caulfield ever made. And he also only ever made screen prints. He never did any etching or lino cutting, just screen printing. He felt the medium worked really well for his type of imagery. The pictures here are not intended to illustrate the poems, but rather complement them. And Caulfield wrote, the images suggest the things that I have imagined the poet seeing when he wrote the poem. So this, this is about Caulfield imagining um, what the poem the poet was thinking when when he was actually writing the poems this was a major work for Patrick Caulfield and he worked on it from 1969 to 1972 so over a three-year period it's also interesting to know that as a printmaker Caulfield didn't embrace any of the other printmaking processes he only ever made screen prints he responded to the medium's capacity for flat areas of intense saturated colour as you can see here. He's enhanced this by printing on a really heavy Neobond synthetic paper. You can see this is a Neobond synthetic paper. It's very, very thick. The image is printed on and then over the top it's been varnished. Um, so it's very, very um, slick. Everybody asks about why sometimes aren't prints signed. And the reason for that is the way they were published. And in this case, because they're a set of screen prints, rather than signing them all individually, what the artist does is he will sign the justification page. And a justification page looks like this. And here we can see one. And this is from one of these sets. And it tells you all about the edition. It tells you things like how many prints were in the edition, the paper they were printed on, the binding of them, how the editions were laid out. And in this case, there was a French and an English edition of these screen prints. So what you get if you purchase one of these is a copy of this, and that goes on the back of the, the frame, and that's the provenance of the piece. So you know that yours will have come from edition A, and there we have Patrick Caulfield's signature on the bottom. All of the titles from these screen prints are taken from a line of the poem. So here we have Watch Me Eat Without Appetite, a la carte. All the benches are wet, the woods are so rusty. And here we have My Life Inspires So Many Desires. So you can see the titles here, they don't necessarily relate to the image that Patrick Caulfield has given you here. There's something about these pictures as well that I think, I think they're all a bit lonely. It's because there's, it's almost like they should have people in them, but they haven't. They're, yeah, they're all a little bit, I don't know, sad in a way, I think. You know, a menu on a table and there's nobody eating. You know, a napkin in a wine glass, there's no bottle of wine to share. Clock on the wall on its own. Yeah, I find, I, I think they're, they're beautifully printed and I love the designs of them, but yeah, I find them a little bit lonely. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about these screen prints and this suite. There's 22 screen prints and you can see them all on our website. As you can see here, they look really good together, hang as a group or individually, but uh, go and have a look at them. Thank you. What is a good pot? I don't know, it's just a very little things, very la justesse, uh, something uh, just, just right.
but it depends on a lot of things, I think. Very often it's an accident, and, uh, but you have to see the accident. And the life comes by this way. If you control all, you have always the same piece and it's not, not very good, I think. Qu'est-ce que c'est ça I like to repair now the pots. Sometimes it's a lot of broken, but... Accident is very important, and you look because uh, it, it gives some other um, things to, to, to do on the, on the pot. Too. When, when I have apprentice, I, I want that he learn this. I make this, I, to look at and to, 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 to think, uh, I like this, I don't like this, and you arrive at the essence of the of the piece, I think. I hope you enjoyed that little interlude, seeing how some of these wonderful vases by Jean-Nicolas Gérard are made, uh, how they're thrown. We thought we'd get them out today and, and show them off in some of their sunlight, uh, if only briefly, in their proper environment. I think David Whiting said of his, of his vases that there's something of uh, the Peter Volkos about Jean-Nicolas, something of that wonderful, rich sculptural feel, that kind of earthiness, the earthiness of la terre, the, the clay that his pots are made from and which nourishes us and feeds us, gives us our food. Before I'm blinded anymore, um, I'm going to hand you over to Jean-Nicolas Gérard now to, to see how some of these pots are, are properly made, how they're, they're decorated, and give you a feel for the, the wonderful openness of his, of his philosophy and of his making. I hope you really enjoy this last clip and that you've uh, enjoyed some, some colour and some sun today.
is the tub of my grandmother. And I take shower when I was little into. Merci. I think I am like uh, uh, old artisan. I am very interested by the, the old traditional sleepwear. Technique is, uh, I think technique is not important. And in the art school, I, um, I think I, I learned to found my own way. And I think it's, this is very, very good for me. Little by little, I, I found my vocabulary. All, all the process is important. The sickness of the sleep, the sickness of the glaze, the, the color, the decoration, the firing, all is very important. And I think it's a very simple technique. Hop là, voilà. Allez. Là, maman, il met Jaspé, you see? The, the mixed. White and uh, red. The name in France is Jaspé. Toujours lourd, hein? Oh! Heavy, heavy. The sleep is very important too because uh, if you are very thin, you can see the clay. If it's uh, sick, you it's very yellow. Uh, it's a, a, a time important for the pot. And after I have the decoration, it's graffito, a lot of graffito. I, um, I like to, to carve and um, it's a good technique for this because uh, you, you can uh, carve in, into the, the clay and the clay come, come, uh, comes through the, the slip. Yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah. When I have all the big pots, I don't know what, what I do. But when I begin one pot, I know what I want. If you beginning and you don't know, it's, yeah, it's not possible. You, you have not the spontaneity. And, uh, but if you decide, you say, OK, I want this, and you go, and it's, and I think it's, uh, a good, good, it's a good way for me. Yeah, c'est bon ça, hein?
Uh, like in the, in the plateau, there is a beautiful farm. It was uh, for make wine. And into uh, you have a beautiful slipwear ties. And it's the same technique of me. All the ties are very old. And uh, the man who made that, he made a lot. And uh, he has to go quick and uh, accident come and some uh, impression of uh, the finger. It's important for me because uh, I think the, the life is here. And um, I look at a lot of uh, all the, the, this, this piece and all the process of this piece. And, and, uh, and, I, uh, and in my own work, I use this. educate, entertain our customers. OK, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. 